Um, but good morning to all of you. Uh, I thank each and every one of you for being here. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to be up here um, where Dave normally is and doing uh, what he normally does, which is proclaiming the word of God. Um, it's an incredible honor to be doing that. I feel like, uh, like Paul says in the beginning of Titus, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which I have been entrusted with by the command of God, our Savior. Um, the message that the Lord really just put on my heart um, leading up to, uh, to today was one of um, assurance. It's kind of a dual message. It's eternal security and the assurance of salvation because you can't really understand one without the other. So I've titled this message, Safe in the Savior. And the summary text is from 1 John 5.13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Again, you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. So this is a message for believers that we may know for sure that we do know him. So getting started, um, I actually have a confession to make. Um, I've been coveting while I'm up here and even last night preparing. Um, <laughs> I covet your prayers. Because I need it. So uh, let's, uh, let's open with prayer and then we'll jump in. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. That, Lord, you indeed are here. I pray that your spirit would be here, Lord, that you would speak through me, Father. It's not my words, Lord, but your words that matter, that hold any weight, and that have any effect on our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to each and every one of us, and that Christ may shine forth. So, Father, help me to do your will. In Jesus' name. So, you might be asking, Johnny, you're talking about assurance, but you're dressed like you're in mourning. Um, why? And I don't have a good answer. I just like wearing black. So, uh, it's been a running thing for most of my life. So, but in all seriousness, um, one of the constant battles in the Christian faith is one right here, of faith and doubt. And our, in, in Christ, we're constantly battling this. We trust him. We know what his word says. We, we believe him. But then we're constantly fighting ourselves. But do we really? Do we really trust everything that he says? Because, you know, we hear it and it might click up here, but to get here is a whole different thing. So it's one of the constant battles of the Christian life. And assurance is a blessing. It's not something that's just automatically given. Um, it's something that, in a sense, we have to work for. So Thomas uh, Brooks, who is an old peer, and I have a lot of dead friends, long dead friends, um, he says that the assurance of salvation is a pearl that most want, but it's also a crown that few wear. So I want to just by a show of hands, um, and look at me, don't look at everyone around you when you do this. How many of you have at one point in your walk doubted your salvation? Oh, look at that, I'm in great company, cool. So my message is relevant. All right. But again, most of us in here have dealt with that, and if not, you're not being honest. So um, what do we do? In what or in whom do we trust for our security in him? But first, before we get into the security, why do we lack? Some reasons for lacking assurance of our salvation. And this isn't exhaustive by any means. Um, I'm just going to briefly touch on each of these guys. The first one is that our doubts are valid, and we're not truly saved. We're unregenerate. In that case, you have a problem. The other 
is maybe you struggle with besetting or habitual sins. Something you just can't shake. You've had it your entire walk. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's lust. Whatever it might be. You've wrestled with this thing. You don't like this thing. You hate it and you want it rid. Yet for some reason it still clings to you and you can't find yourself shaking it. That's going to affect your assurance. The other one, which this is never good to do, whether it's with this subject or anything else, is comparing ourselves to other believers' progress. Doing the comparison game is never really a good thing. Um, it's dangerous. It's never accurate, and uh, especially in our walks. If I'm looking at any other believer in this room, and I'm comparing myself to you and your progress, I shouldn't do that. That's going to affect me. Um, you know, Dave's up here all the time. We see Dave, and we love Dave, but we're not Dave. I'm not Dave. I can't expect to be him. I can't expect to walk the same steps that he walks. We're to follow Christ. We're to emulate in any other believer what is shown through them of Christ. Like Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So that it, whatever you see in another believer, in your brother or sister in Christ that, that looks like Jesus, do that. Anything else, don't do. Um, another one is accusations of Satan. Um, again, the enemy hasn't changed his tactics since the garden. He challenged Eve, saying, did God really say? You know, he's always challenging God's word. He's accusing us. He, he, the scriptures call him the accuser, um, amongst other things. But he always wants to rattle us, to cause us to doubt God and to challenge his word. Another one is suffering trials. The storms of this life, like our brother Carl last week was saying about, they're going to come. But how do we deal with them? How do they affect us? Trials will come. They're just a part of life. We can't avoid them. They're going to be there. Yet we shouldn't let it tackle or uh, rattle our assurance. Yet it can, if we're being honest. Another one is just we don't feel saved or close to God. It could be for no rhyme or reason. We could be doing everything right. We could be spiritually okay. And yet we just don't feel his presence. We don't feel close to him. Um, you, we don't feel saved. And one of the biggest ones is the one on the bottom here. Uh, it's a misunderstanding or a lack of faith in God's word and promises. We either understand his word wrongly or we have a lack of faith and trust in it. And that is huge. We should believe God for what he says because his, his word is truth. So as I asked earlier, where or with whom does our salvation lie? And all of scripture is good. And one of my issues I told my wife was there's so much on this subject. I had to editorialize so much down, yet I figure I'll stick with what Jesus says for most of this, because, you know, he has some good things to say. <laughs> so let's go into John 6. Jesus says here, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Notice where I highlighted here in the first verse especially, all will come to me. Now, that's not every single person, keep it in context, but all that the Father gives him will come to him, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That's a promise. And do you realize that you're a gift to Christ? If you're in him, you're a gift from the Father to him. I don't feel like a gift. <laughs> I live with myself. <laughs> You know, we can understand how Christ is a gift to us, but we being a gift to him is an entirely different thing. So do you realize that? And if not, why not? Again, I don't feel like a gift. Well, that doesn't invalidate his word. Amen. The redemption of God's elect 
and this is where I want us to rest our security on. God's elect, or believers, is certain because it's secured by his ultimate purpose and power. Look what he says here. He will lose nothing that has been given to him, but he will raise it up on the last day. And everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. So, okay. So we might understand that, right? Yet, it's still challenged. So, more words from Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and you guys know this verse, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true and comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carry, uh, carried out in God. Do we bring ourselves before Christ? Lord, look at my life. It's uncomfortable because we know we're dirty. We know we're messy. We don't do everything perfectly. That's everybody's problem. There's nobody in this room who's lived a perfect life. Not me, up here, not anybody. So we're all in the same playing field here. So what do we do about it? He says to come to him. Now you say, okay, Johnny, I get it. You're talking about Jesus and no one can, you know, uh, we have to come to him, and if we come into him, then, you know, we're going to be safe in him. But what if, what if I can, you know, fall away? Okay, the scriptures are just falling away. But again, what does Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So do you obey the voice of the shepherd? And he says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hands. I and the father are one, meaning they're on the same page. They have the same plan. If you're in Christ, you're safe. And don't fall into the thinking, oh, well, you know, it doesn't, it, it says that no one can snatch him out of, you know, um, they, I, I can't be snatched out of his hand, but I can jump out. You know, <laughs> really? Do you want to play that game? Do you want to really, you want to think that you're stronger than God? Like, he's the, he holds the universe together. He keeps the atoms spinning. And you think by your own strength, you're going to jump out of his hand if he's deemed you safe. And I'm not yelling at anybody. I'm talking to myself because I feel that way. <laughs> Again, we're talking about assurance here. So we're guarded by the Lord. We have th this is just three passages from Christ himself on our safety in him if we've come to him. So he guards us. But how are we guarded by him? Again, let's see how Jesus addresses this in John 17. It's a lot of scripture today, but it's all good. So I'm going to be winded, but you guys get to just read along. So John 17, this is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane on the night um, of his arrest. He says, and I, he's praying to the father here, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, holy father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. 
I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Do not ask... I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Remember this verse. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. And I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me, through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that in the world, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you that have sent me. And these know, sorry, that you have sent me. I may known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So that's a big chunk of scripture, yet there's a lot of stuff in there that we can rest our hope on. He's praying for the disciples here in the context of the passage, yet notice the only one who was lost was the son of destruction. And it was for a specific purpose that scripture might be fulfilled. We know from the gospel records that Judas was the one apostle who fell away. And, you know, you do some digging, you study that. It doesn't mean that Jesus or uh, Judas, sorry, um, truly believed and he lost his salvation. Judas was never saved. He was the son of destruction. He was there for a purpose. Yet we also see here, well, go back to Judas for a second. At the end of the, um, the Last Supper, towards the end of the Last Supper, Judas determines in his heart to betray Christ. And it says that Satan entered him. Look at what I have highlighted here. Keep them from the evil one. If you're in Christ, you're protected. Not because you've done anything special, but because Jesus intercedes for you. You're not going to be filled by the enemy of our souls if you're in Christ. And he's going to protect you from his attacks. So he protects us from Satan. We're also built up in his word. Sanctify them in your truth. And what is his truth? His word. The scriptures. But notice... In the context here, he's praying for the disciples, but he's not just praying for the disciples. By extension, he's praying for us today in all generations who believe in Christ. It's not just for the disciples, but for us also. So take heart in the fact that Christ prays for you. Amen. Rest in that. How often do we go about our day and we're, you know, something happens and, you know, my car breaks down or, you know, I deal with this uh, irritating person at work and I get all flustered and all that stuff. You think Jesus doesn't know that? That he's not praying for you in the midst of it? <laughs> so often we walk around like it's all on us, yet we have an intercessor. So here's some verses um, throughout the scriptures demonstrating that Jesus continues to pray for his sheep. Romans 8 uh, 34, it says, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And in two verses from Hebrews I have, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear 
in the presence of God on our behalf. And one more. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. A lot of people ask, what is Jesus doing now in heaven? Right there. <laughs> One of the multitude of things that he's doing. He, he's very good at, at juggling. So, not only though does Jesus pray for us, but the Holy Spirit also intercedes to help us to pray. So let's look at Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You ever not know what to pray or how to pray? The Lord knows. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So he helps us to pray for what we ought to. And we know, I love this, rest in this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Not everything good happens to us, but everything that happens to us in our lives in Christ, he uses for his good, for our good, sorry, and his ultimate glory. All things work together for good, those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, meaning he knew before we were born. He had an intimate knowledge of who we are and what we will be. He also predestined, determined that they would be his, to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among, among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Our path in our Christian walk is secure. It says it right here. Those whom he predestined, he called you to himself. He determined that you would be his. He called you. And if he's called you, you're justified. Meaning, in Christ, your sins are forgiven. And if you're justified, that means you're going to be glorified. You're going to make it. You're going to be sinlessly perfect in eternity. Not on this, not on this side. This side we're dealing with our flesh, we're dealing with our remaining sin, yet we're not content in it. And we look to be more and more like Christ and reflect his character. Amen. So again though, this pesky thing, doubt. I see that on the screen. I read it here to you. I understand it mentally, yet it has trouble sitting here. And why? Because stuff happens. Things rattle me. Things rattle us. But again, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He sent his son from the glory of heaven to put on our flesh and walk in this fallen world to live the righteous life that we could never live. And the world hated him and hung him on a cross and he died willingly to save us. He was buried and he rose as that stamp of approval. He rose from the dead and secured our salvation. So if he did that, isn't he going to keep you? Amen. It is God. <clears throat> Who shall bring, sorry, the, verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who? Who? It's a rhetorical question, meaning no one and nothing can challenge that because God has set it in stone. It is God who justifies. It's not the world. It's not our family. 
It's not our friends as much as they love us and care for us. It's God who justifies. Only Jesus is going to be able to atone for your sins. I can't do it. Dave can't do it. We might want to, but we can't. Only Jesus. Verse 34, who is to condemn? Again, rhetorical question. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed, again, is interceding for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, no. Distress, mm -mm. persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Notice it's through Christ. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come. So don't worry about things down the road that you can't change because it's not going to change your salvation. Nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation. Not just this world. Massive asteroid barreling down from you know, three galaxies away isn't going to shake it either. We'll be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Rest in that verse. Nothing, nothing, no thing can separate us from the love of Christ. But again, we doubt. We understand it. Okay, we read it. Makes sense. But why do we have a hard time believing it? And I find comfort that even in my doubt, the disciples doubted. And we like to talk about how much of a bonehead Peter was. Um, <laughs> yet, at one point, Jesus says to Peter in Luke, in, uh, Luke, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. Yet, I have prayed for you. So again, he prayed for the disciples. He's going to pray for us too. And we see Peter, again, walking out on the water during the storm. He actually, he tells the Lord, command me to come out and I'll, you know, I'll walk out. And he does. So he starts taking steps and he sees the waves around him and he starts to sink. Because again, where was his focus? And then, lo and behold, Jesus grips him and pulls him up. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. His eyes left his Savior. He started focusing on what was the chaos around him. But yet he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately, there was no hesitation. There was no, oh, this guy again. There, it was immediate. He grabbed him, reached out his hand, and took hold of him. It doesn't say Peter took hold of Christ. It says Christ took hold of him. Saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why do we doubt? We see these great and glorious promises that the Lord gives us, yet he doesn't rip Peter up and down. And likewise, he doesn't rip us up and down. He goes, oh, you a little faith. Why did you doubt? He's gentle. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, he didn't, he, he knew. He knew they disobeyed. And he comes, Adam, where are you? But God didn't know. He, he was doing so in asking that of Adam to elicit a confession, to garner repentance. Yet, the, Lord's so, the Lord is always gentle with us. Yet we think that he's, you know, the lightning's going to come down and the hammer's going to fall. We're constantly waiting for it because we, we live with ourselves. We feel our own sin. And the Lord doesn't treat us the way we deserve. Obviously because he sent his son, which none of us deserve. He would have been completely justified in leaving us to our own devices. So the security of our faith in Christ is a fact. Not because of what we've done, but because of who he is and what he has done. So if we can rest, that, rest in that, if we can believe that, 
What does it look like in the one who truly believes in him, and how can we have assurance of that? Let's go to Second Peter chapter 1. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an inheritance, an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see that first line? That first verse? He has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. That's an amazing statement. We get to partake in not divinity where we become gods, but we get to partake in who God is. We are like, we are lower than, than the dust. And even our sins, like he is completely holy. And we're just this walking dumpster fire who <laughs> has to stand before him. And it rightly terrifies us when we think of his holiness. Yet he allows us entrance in to partake, to be like him. Again, not as God, but we get to reflect his character and the character of his son. It's an amazing thing. Again, it doesn't make us divine, but we get to shine his qualities, his character, because his spirit dwells in us. We believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three of them working at once to get us to the finish line. They equally care for us. And they give us a new heart and new affections. Then after this, we're given a list of qualities that reflect God's character. So again, if this reality is true, therefore these qualities will shine at some point in your life. Now, the order is not of super importance how they come. It doesn't mean like if you have this, then you'll have this and vice versa. These things stem from each other. But the two I want to focus on is faith and love. Those are the bookends. Everything else can be mixed around and all that stuff. But again, faith is the first one. And it's first for a reason. Because if you don't have faith, you're not going to be able to accurately have any of these things. Um, and the end result is love. Love for God and love for man. But he says too, if these qualities are yours or it, and are increasing. So how do you know if you're in Christ? You see some of these qualities. And they're increasing. It's not, you know, it's not day today necessarily, but in the progress of your life, these things will be growing in you. So what are they? Faith, the basis of it, right? That we believe in Christ and what he said. Virtue or moral excellence. Our morals are straight. They reflect God's character in them. Knowledge, moral wisdom, knowing the truth of Christ and who he said he is. Self-control, mastering our sinful desires, breaking our flesh and living for Christ instead. Steadfastness or hopeful endurance. When we get beat up by this life, when we walk and we get battered and we get discouraged, it doesn't stop us from pursuing Christ. We keep going. We keep always moving forward. Sometimes the progression of our Christian lives feel like uh, two steps forward, three steps back, if we're being honest. Yet, 
it's a con it's like the stock market not to bring up that but it's constantly going up you have dips and all that stuff but gradually it's constantly going up it's like this you know um that's our life in christ that's our sanctification it's messy yet we're messy but there's always this progression forward we're not going backwards and you should be going forward because if you're not you're going to only go backwards it's like a car being stalled out on, uh, on a hill. So godliness is the next one. It's reverence towards him. Or another word, holiness. Brotherly affection. It's love towards other believers. And then finally, love. The Greek word is agape. It's the same love that God shows to us. That same love we are to show to others. That self-sacrificial love that Christ shows to us. And what excuse do we have to not show it? Again, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have no excuse to, to show it. Well, because we don't feel like it? Because somebody hurt us, did us wrong? Oh, really? You want to compare laundry lists? <laughs> Look at what we did against Christ. Uh, you don't want to play that game. <laughs> we'll walk away embarrassed. So if we are in Christ, we will show these qualities in our lives and they will be increasing over the course of our life. It's not optional, these things. They're not going to be in full swing all the time. Again, and they're not, it's not going to be perfect. We don't perfectly ever do anything in our flesh. We can't. Yet through Christ, we can aim for it. And his righteousness is credited to us. His perfection. If we could be perfect, we wouldn't need him. Notice verse 9. Says that those who lack these things are nearsighted and blind. Forgetting their cleansing of sin. Now we can argue after this what this means. If it challenges the doctrine of election and all that stuff. If you can lose your salvation. I'm not getting into that. I think here he's talking about habitual sin and it's being the cause of lacking assurance again our sin is disobedience when we walk in disobedience with the Lord it's going to affect that relationship my family loves me but if I wrong them there's going to be a wall up it doesn't mean that they don't love me it doesn't mean that you know there's no forgiveness in there but there's going to be like a tension until that issue is resolved. The same is true with the Lord. If we sin against him, until we repent of that and bring that before him and be like, Lord, I am so sorry. I will never do this again. Okay. That's going to affect our assurance if we don't do that. So we, we need to do these things. Yet if we don't, and again, we have these habitual sins, it's going to affect our assurance and it's going to keep us from really enjoying that blessing. Yet, it says if we practice these things and see them in our lives, we will have assurance that we're saved. As you grow in these qualities, you have to remember that because the work has been done in you is the reason that these qualities are shining. It's not because you're earning these things. It's not, oh, if I do these things, then the Lord's going to love me. No, no, no. That's, it, it's complete, flip that on its head. It's the Lord loves me. Therefore, I'm going to live like this. Because what other way are, are you, are you going to choose to live? When, such, when you realize the weight of what Christ did for us, you can't, you can't choose any other way. You can't stay there anyway. So our works don't save us, but they demonstrate that we are saved. And this is the thing that I want you guys to, to really grip. I'm not giving you anything new. We're a solid church. Dave is a great teacher. And we believe the scriptures here. So like Peter says, by way of reminder, I remind you of all these things. So in James, it says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Also, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Feet, or sorry, our faith has feet to it. It's not stagnant. If you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. Satan and the demons believe every single word of the scriptures. They know it better than anyone else, any one of us in here. They've been around longer than anyone. So they know it. Yet it causes them to shudder because they know their time is short. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Again, our works don't save us. They're not the basis of our salvation. Christ and his work is. There's really only two religions in this world. There's the religion of do, which you can group all the world religions in. Anything that has you doing something to earn an eternity or salvation or anything like that. And then you have a religion of done, which is Christianity. It's what's been done on your behalf for you. And you accept that gift. There's really only two. So works can be done in Jesus' name. And they should be done in Jesus' name. But again, what's the motive? We shouldn't be trying to earn a salvation. We should be doing it as an outpouring that we've been saved. I'm going to bring up a verse that personally has terrified me from the start of my walk. And I don't do this to discourage you. I do this to make a point. Um, but it's in Matthew 7. And it's Jesus talking about the last day. I'm going to skip down to verse 21 for the sake of time. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Do you see what they're claiming? They're saying, Lord, Lord. That's a phrase of intimacy, that repetition. That means that they have an intimate knowledge of they know who Jesus is. Yet what are they banking on? Right. We prophesied in your name. I preached your truth in your name. I can't bank I'm proclaiming God's truth to any of you here before the Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? I've never casted out a demon. Have you? Where's my Pentecostal friends? <laughs> to, to, or do many mighty works in your name. You know what's terrifying? Think about Judas. Judas will hear this. Judas did this. He was one of, when they sent them out two by two, they, he was in a pairing that did miraculous things in the name of the Lord. Yet what was he? A worker of lawlessness. We cannot rest on our good deeds, no matter how lofty, how good it makes us feel. None of that. It has to be what Jesus did for us and what Jesus did alone. It doesn't matter if you know Christ. It matters if he knows you. So don't gamble with your soul. I don't like gambling in general. I like, I work hard for my money. I like to keep it. <laughs> and I've never won whenever I have gambled. Yet, if I'm not, I don't like gambling with my money, which is such a fickle thing compared to my soul. Yet how many of us go out into the world and we don't think of Christ? I don't think of Christ all the time, to my shame, and I should. 
And I'm sure every one of us has days where we go about our day, we go to work, we do all sorts of things, associate with friends, watch sports, all that stuff. And the Lord doesn't even cross our minds. Yet, even still, he's interceding for us. So don't gamble with your soul because eternity is forever. I don't want anybody leaving here today knowing one way or the other where they stand. It's part of my motivations for, um, for teaching this. And if you're unsure, test yourself. So how do we do that? I didn't plan on getting emotional, but here we are. So again, some tests, and I'm not going to read the entire book of 1 John for you. I taught through it years ago. It was a wonderful blessing for me personally. Read through it. You can do it in an hour. I know because I did it yesterday Um, (laughs) because I had to go over these things and make sure I knew what I was teaching you guys. So there's eight tests, and you can look elsewhere in the scripture, but I'm going to just cover these, and I'm not going to go super in-depth because of time. But we're gonna we're gonna jump into these and um, we're gonna go through these. So, number one: Do we walk in light or in darkness? We should. And remember, guys, it's progress, not perfection. Don't be unnerved if you don't see these qualities perfectly in your life. Because I'm up here preaching this, and I don't see all these qualities perfectly in my life. I see them to some measure, which is evidence of the Spirit in me. But again, compare yourself to these things. If we walk in the light, we will be sinning less. We won't be sinless. Again, we'll be reflecting God's character. It says, if we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as Christ is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. The second test is, do we say we have no sin, or do we confess our sins? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. Yet if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, and to cleanse us from all sin unrighteousness. I don't ever want to stand before the Lord and be accused of calling him a liar. I know myself. I live with myself. My wife can attest for it because she lives with me too. We're both sinful people. And every one of us is in our own ways. We're all, again, the loving, the playing field is level. We're all guilty before him. What are we resting in? Do we keep his commandments? We will desire to keep his commandments and to walk in obedience to him. You have the Ten Commandments, right? Moses, right? In the, in the, the old movie, um, Ten Commandments. Jesus sums up the two tables of the law into two. The first four commandments pertain to our standing and actions before God. The other six are before our fellow man. He sums them up into two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. If you didn't think, if you think you're good, I've, I'm good, I got the commandments, I got them down pat, no, no problem. Yeah, I hate to break it to you, but the first commandment alone, you've never done for a fraction of a second in your entire existence. The only one who ever did was Jesus. And if we can't do one, the other one can't be done well either. It's stuff that we strive for, but we're resting on the finished work of Christ on our behalf. He says, whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth isn't in him. Yet whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which he walked. Read the Gospels read the scriptures in general, look at how Jesus walked. We're to follow him. Again, it's never perfection. You're never going to make it to perfection this side of eternity. But the promise is to strive after and reflect these things as best we can because of our love for Christ. So the fourth test 
if it will come up, is do we love our brother or hate our brother? This is pertaining to other believers. It says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. We're going to love fellow believers in Christ, however imperfectly, yet it's going to be different from the love that the world has for each other. It's that same agape love that Christ shows for us. He said to the disciples, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus says, you will know my disciples by their love. So do we love? I think I see that here often in the church. That's honestly what's kept me here for as long as I've been here. It's the love of Christ. It's a beautiful thing, and we do it well. Do we love the world or hate the world? That doesn't mean the created world. It doesn't mean we go outside and kick a tree, you know, or or shoot a bird or anything like that because it's evil. (laughs) I got married and I became like a crazy cat guy. You know, we have a bunch of feral cats and I end up feeding them all the time and I'm just like, man, you softy. Anyway, I love the Lord's creation because he's made it. So that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the, the created world system, the rebellious, wicked, prideful, self-centered world system that is everywhere. I mean, you go out, you're going to leave here and you're going to be assaulted by all sorts of insanity in this country alone. It's, the, it's like they've taken the scriptures and the whole thing that, uh, the whole basis of the foundation of the country and just set it on fire and threw gasoline on it and then threw it out, out, out the window. It, it, our culture is absolutely insane right now. And it's because they've stepped away from the Lord, they've completely lost sight of God, and they are so self-absorbed and self-centered that it's just causing chaos. You know, the answer for our problems is never in ourselves. That's the cause of our problems. Yet self-help books will tell you, oh, you just need to fix yourself. No, you need to look elsewhere. (laughs) You need to look to Christ. So loving the world means, the uh, again, the world system and the prideful rebellion that inhabits it. Choosing to follow, they choose to follow self rather than the Lord. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father. But it's from the world. And the world is passing away. Why are you going to find your joy in something that's not going to last? But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So to do the will of God, that means you need to know it, right? We, need, we find that out through his word, so we need to be students of it. Do we practice righteousness or sin? We'll desire to practice righteousness and not to sin however imperfect, yet we'll be repentant when we do fail and fall short. The practice of our lives will not be unrepentant sin, but gradual holiness. It says, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure, making our calling and election sure. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. So you say, Johnny, I see sin in my life. Does that mean I'm not a believer? No, because he says earlier in the book, if you have sinned, we have an advocate before the Father. You need to confess your sins to him and it's a promise that he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We, it's not a once and, repentance isn't a once and done thing, it's a lifestyle. You're continually bringing yourself before the Lord. Lord, I screwed up today. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, die, I sent my son to die for you because I knew you were gonna screw up. But again, it's the practice of these things? Do you practice sinning? Or do you practice righteousness? Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Again, it's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ reflected in you. One more time. 
There we go. Do we love? Now, Johnny, you said we covered this one already. Do we love our brother? It's a more general statement. Do you love God? Do you love God as the Father loves the Son? Do you demonstrate that inter-Trinitarian love? Love isn't a mere sentiment. It's not just a feeling. We get all sorts of rattled. You see every teen couple, I think of like the relationship I've been in. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. No, I love you. You know, you're not you're staying up until three in the morning on the phone. Like, no, you hang up. No, I love you. You hang up. You know, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> that's not what's, it, like, that's fluffy puppy love sentiment. What the love that God shows to us is action. He gave us his son. He lived he spent 33 just about years on this like dump of a sphere compared to heaven. <laughs> Yet he lived to do the will of his father because he loved his father. We need to do the same. And do we? In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, meaning the sacrifice. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The basis of our affections for each other comes from our affection towards God. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And then the final test in 1 John is do we believe God? And I think this is the most important one because if you don't have this, you're not gonna, none of the other ones are going to matter. If you don't believe in his word, you don't trust in him, you can't do any of these things. Will we believe God's testimony over the arguments of man? This passage says that if we do this, the Holy Spirit testifies to us that we are saved. So it's not just working for our own selves to, to prefer or uh, to shore up our, you know, certainty that we know him. But there's this, this mysterious kind of application here where as we walk, the Holy Spirit of God grants us assurance and blesses us with it. First John 5, 10 through 12 says, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself of the Holy Spirit. Whoever did not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his Son. Do you see how everything falls into line and rests on who Jesus is and what he did? This isn't, Peter says, we hadn't come to you with made up fables and myth. This is historical fact. And I know because I love history. So anyway, do you believe the testimony that God has concerning his son? And what is that testimony? That God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Jesus said in John fourteen six. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but, th uh, but through me. I have a, Pastor Dave has made fun of me for it, but I have a bumper sticker on my car that says contradict, and it's all the symbols of the major world religions. I like to drive past the people with the coexist bumper sticker on it and kind of like just slow down and like read it, you know? Because um, it's like, one's true, one's not. If you doubt me, look at Israel. That's two religions that have constantly been fighting and they can't coexist. They will not. Yet Jesus, when he said that, claimed himself as exclusivity. He declared, he declared that he's the only way. Everyone wants Jesus on their team. Nobody wants to listen to what Jesus said. And if you look at the major world religions, they always have a facet of Jesus in there. Yet it's not the biblical Christ. It's who they want him to be. We don't get to play that game. You accept him for who he is or you don't take him at all.
So the arguments of this world, right? They're going to they're going to fight against these things and push back. The world system. Look at Jude 1. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, in the last days, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So we're given this ad- admonition and this charge to keep going. We're going to go and we're going to do battle with the world. We're going to butt heads. Yet we're to seek after Christ and what he's told us to do. And in that, we're going to gain our assurance. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Build yourselves up with the most holy faith. And have mercy on those who doubt. If you're walking around, if, you're, if you have assurance, if the Lord's blessed you with assurance and you're dealing with an, another believer who doesn't, have mercy on them. Help them. Come alongside them. I have a friend who for years struggled with his salvation. Good, solid brother he is. And he just could not understand, like, the Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. Yeah, you're a mess, but the Lord loves you. And I got frustrated with him one night. I was like, I was like, brother, if you truly believe you're not saved, go back and leave your wife, leave your kids, go back into the world and do all the things that you were doing before the Lord got a hold of you. And he looked at me like I had 17 heads. And I'm like, there you go. If you did not have the Lord in your life, you would be like, okay. Being married doesn't, you know, just automatically make you faithful. Having a family doesn't automatically make you, you know, a good father and all that stuff. It's the work of Christ in us that gives us assurance, that causes us to not seek after sin and to follow him instead. It says here too, the scoffers, those following their ungodly passions, those who cause divisions, in the verses prior, he's talking about a warning against false teachers. These people make themselves known by what they do. They're not chasing after Christ. They might claim the name, but how they live. I watched a documentary last night on all sorts of false teachers claiming to know Jesus and all sorts of stuff. Yet their works were wicked. So false teachers will make themselves known and evident by their own bondage and how they live. Yet, look at this last verse. This is um, in verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. It's one of my favorite verses. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority. Before all time and now and forever. God is not only able to keep you, but he's joyful. It brings him joy to get you to the finish line to keep you from stumbling. Again, he doesn't hold the universe in his hands and he doesn't keep everything set in motion only to set you on your way when you first come to him and just to stumble and fall and never make it. One of my favorite preachers, Paul Washer, said, Jesus Christ didn't shed his precious blood for you so that when you stand before him at the end of your days that the first thing you'll see on his face is a scowl or a frown. Yet, I know for myself, that's how often I think of when I see the Lord face to face at the end of my days, I'm going to see that. It's not the case. I have to, I have to fight against that. I want to hear this. Well done, good and faithful servant. Again, I, I think of standing before the Lord and he's going to be like an angry judge. 
and it's not. I imagine it's going to be more like this. Yet we walk carrying our own sin because we know ourselves. And it challenges if we know him or not. That's the constant fight. Again, from the beginning, faith and doubt. Which one are you going to choose to seek after? Are you going to believe what God says about you or are you going to believe your own flesh? So look to Christ and seek his face in your doubting. Because he's able and willing both to save and to keep you. And I want to end with um, the last verse, the last phrase of one of my most favorite songs that I've been listening to lately. It's called Christ Be All. It's by this group called Grace Worship. It says, on golden shores of sure salvation, I will run to meet my king. Free from shame and all accusation, he will give himself and nothing I'll bring. So I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. If you have to talk to me, or Randy, or Carl, or really anyone else in this church, don't leave here without knowing your place before him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you hold us secure, Lord, that you sent your son to die for us, pray, Lord, that you would help us to continue to walk with you, to seek your face, Lord, and when we doubt, to remind us of the love that you have for us. Remind us, Lord, of the characteristics that only we can shine because of what you've done in us, Lord. I pray, Lord, for everyone here that you would make them know their state. Have mercy on those who doubt. Shore them up. And for those who know, Lord, strengthen that confidence even more, that they may help. And for those who don't, Lord, who don't know you, soften their hearts and draw them to yourself. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.